my love for the night sky began a long time ago. I grew up in the tiny rural farming town of Bee Branch, Arkansas. Official population, 63. I'm not kidding. But while my small hometown might not have had much of a social scene, the night sky was breathtaking. I spent much of my childhood lying on blankets out in the field behind my mom and dad's house and asking my parents questions about the stars, about how the universe worked, about what lies beyond what we can see. And my parents weren't scientists, and these were the days before the internet. But I remember one day I asked my mom some outlandish question about the universe, and she looked at me and she said, I don't know the answer to that question, but one day you can figure it out. And that's really what set me on my path to becoming an astronomer. And of course, I'm not alone in my love for the night sky. For centuries, human beings have been captivated by the night sky. A dark sky full of stars has always been a standing invitation to ask big questions. And these questions go beyond just being scientific questions. They're questions that get to the heart of what it means to be a human being. Where do we come from? How do we get here? Are we alone? And there's so much we can learn about astronomy just from simply looking up at the night sky. Our ancestors learned about the way the world works from watching how the constellations would appear and reappear over the course of the year. The very first astronomers noticed that some of the brightest stars in the sky moved in a different way than most of the stars. And of course, those turned out to be planets in our solar system. At that time, it was assumed that Earth, our fragile blue planet, was the center of it all, that all the other celestial bodies revolved around the Earth. And then one day, a little over 400 years ago, Galileo took his telescope, which was originally intended to watch ships coming over the horizon, and pointed it to the sky, and everything changed. That simple act shifted the paradigm of how we view the universe and ultimately how we view ourselves. Of course, what Galileo discovered was that Jupiter had moons that were orbiting around it. That means they weren't orbiting around the Earth. That means the Earth wasn't the center of the universe. Game changer. And since that time, of course, our telescopes have gotten bigger and better. As an astronomer, I've been really lucky to have observed at some of the world's biggest telescopes in Chile and Hawaii. We put our biggest telescopes on the ground on tall mountains so that we can try to get above the Earth's atmosphere, which serves to blur and obscure the celestial objects that we're trying to look at. But even on the tallest mountains, we still have to deal with the atmosphere. Now, we've found really cool ways to counteract some of the blurring effects of the Earth's atmosphere. But we still have to deal with the fact that the atmosphere is there, and our Earth's atmosphere completely obstructs some wavelengths of light, completely. Now, that's good for life on Earth, not so good for astronomers who want to view their objects in all the wavelengths of light. So what do we do? We put telescopes in space. And of course, of all the telescopes, the space telescopes, the Hubble Space Telescope is the world's most famous. Hubble has now been in space for a little over 26 years. It celebrates its 27-year birthday this year. Hubble has become so much more than a scientific tool. It's become an inspiration for the world. It's become a pop culture icon. You can find Hubble images everywhere, in TV and films, as music, album art, on the sides of U-Haul trucks. Ask anyone in the world to name a telescope, and they're probably going to say Hubble. The beauty of Hubble's images have captivated the world. But it's not really straightforward why that is. Why do we find beauty in Hubble's images? It's natural that we find beauty in images like 
sunsets or oceans or mountains. Those things are all part of our everyday experience as human beings. But nebulae aren't. Why do we find these images beautiful? I'm not sure that I know the answer to that question. But I think part of the reason might be that we know that on a deep level that we're connected to the cosmos. We know that when we look up at the heavens, that in a sense we're looking back at ourselves, back at our origins. The iron in our blood and the calcium in your bones was literally forged inside of a star that ended its life in grand fashion as a supernova. We're connected viscerally to the universe. Hubble's images also transcend languages and national borders. Their beauty is universal. Hubble's images have also told us they were connected to each other. Of all these beautiful Hubble images that we've gotten over the past 27 years, if I had to pick a personal favorite, this would be it. This is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This image came out when I was in graduate school, so that's another reason it's sort of special to me. I did a lot of my dissertation research on this image. But for a bigger reason than just that, this image has changed the way we understand the universe. So, you go outside tonight, look up at the stars. Every star that you see in the sky is part of our home galaxy, the Milky Way. But for this image, Hubble stared past the Milky Way into this tiny little dark piece of sky. So that's like looking at the universe through a straw. If you held out your pinky finger, you could cover up this image. And in this image, Hubble sees 10,000 galaxies. Every single point of light in this image, except for just a few ground, uh, foreground stars, is an individual galaxy containing billions of stars. And so just imagine, take this little tiny patch of sky, multiply it by the huge number of times you would need to fill up the entire sky. What Hubble has shown us is that there are hundreds of billions of other galaxies outside of our Milky Way. Hubble has given us the size of the universe. But as amazing as Hubble is, as wonderful as it's been, as much as it's taught us over the past 27 years, there are some ways that we've pushed Hubble to its limits. And in deep images like this, like the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, at some point we come to the edge of what we can see. And so we need a new, different, more powerful telescope that will help us see beyond that edge and learn amazing new things about the universe. And so at NASA, we are working on the scientific successor to Hubble, the James Webb Space Telescope. This telescope is designed to answer the biggest questions in astronomy today, those questions that Hubble just can't quite get to. And I truly believe that the Webb Telescope will be a worthy successor to the Hubble. So Webb is different from Hubble in a few key ways. And the first is the size. So Webb is big, really big. Webb will be by far the biggest telescope we've ever sent to space. Hubble's about the size of a school bus. Top to bottom, Webb stands over three stories tall and is as wide as a tennis court. The second big difference between Webb and Hubble is the place and space that Webb will be. Hubble orbits the Earth about 350 miles up, relatively close. We're gonna put Webb out a million miles from Earth. That's about four times further away than the moon. We put Webb in this part of space so it can get really cold. And that leads to the third key difference between Hubble and Webb, which is the type of light that Webb will see. Hubble is primarily a visible light telescope. It sees the universe primarily in optical light that your eyes can see. Webb will see the universe in a whole new light, in infrared light. Infrared light is just a little bit more red than what your eyes can see. And Hubble has a little tiny bit of capability in the near infrared. And this image shows a tantalizing hint of what we might be able to see with Webb. So with all of these new uh, technologies, we hope to learn a few key things about the universe. The first thing we want to find is the very first galaxies that were born after the Big Bang. Telescopes are time machines. 
They literally allow us to see objects as they were in the past. As we use our telescopes to look at objects that are further away in space, the light from those objects takes time to travel through space to reach our telescopes. And the further back we look in distance, the further back we're looking in time. And so with Hubble, we've been able to push back and see distant galaxies, but we have yet to see the very first galaxies that were born after the Big Bang. So we're talking about looking back in time over 13 and a half billion years. We have computer simulations that show us what we think that part of the universe might look like, but there are no telescopes right now in space or on the ground that are powerful enough to observe this part of the universe. And with Webb, we hope to see these infant galaxies. Another big key goal of Webb is to learn how galaxies grow over time. So we want to see how those infant galaxies grow up to be the grown-up galaxies that we see in the nearby universe today. So the distant galaxies are much different than galaxies in the nearby universe. And how that whole process happens is still a big mystery to astronomers. And so with Webb, we hope to be able to learn a lot more about that process in a new way. The third key thing we want to learn with Webb is about how stars are born. So stars are the building blocks of galaxies, but there's a lot about their formation that we just don't know. And that's because stars are born inside dusty cocoons. And we can't see the sites of the star formation, at least in visible light. Infrared light has the really great property that it's able to peer through dust to see the stars inside being born. And in addition to stars, we plan to study planets, both planets within our solar system and planets outside our solar system, exoplanets. Now, when I was a kid, we only knew of the planets inside our own solar system. Now, today, thanks to telescopes like NASA's Kepler telescope, we know that the universe is literally teeming with planets. Go outside at night, point up at a star, and chances are there's at least one planet orbiting that star. That's a complete paradigm shift. Kepler has shown us that these star and planet systems come in an incredible variety in combinations that we had never imagined before. The Kepler telescope finds these planets by staring at a star, watching for the light in the star to dip down, which means a planet has passed in front, a transit. So that's how Kepler has found all these planets. But with Webb, we want to go one step further. We want to watch the starlight as it filters through the atmosphere and learn about the chemical components of those atmospheres. We want to be able to find chemicals like water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, the chemicals that would signal habitability. Now, this is really, really hard, and this image demonstrates why. This is an actual image from one of NASA's solar observatories of the transit of Venus that happened a few years ago. Now, if you squint, you can almost see the tiny little atmosphere that Venus has. Stars are bright, planets are tiny, and their atmospheres are minuscule. We need incredibly advanced technology to be able to look in detail at these atmospheres. But with Webb, we have it. So even with all of that technology, we would really need a planet system that was relatively nearby, had the planets that were the right distance from the star, all the right things to line up to find a potentially habitable planetary system. We require a lot of luck, but sometimes nature delivers. Just a few weeks ago, we got new observations of the TRAPPIST-1 planet system, which is a mere 40 light years away, our cosmic backyard. These new observations tell us that three of these seven planets likely lie in the habitable zone. Now, we don't know anything about these planets. We don't know if they have atmospheres or if they would be hospitable to life. But with Webb, we intend to look. And the great news is that after two decades of hard work, 
we are almost finished building this incredible machine. The iconic gold mirrors of the Webb telescope were one of the first technologies that we started working on. The whole mirror put together is about 21 feet wide, and it's coated in an incredibly thin layer of gold because gold is highly reflective in infrared light. The mirrors are also incredibly precise. If you were to stretch out that 21-foot mirror to be the size of the continental US, the biggest bumps and valleys would only be a few inches. This is incredibly difficult engineering, and this is the first time a mirror like this has ever been sent to space. Just last year, we finished assembling this giant mirror. So much work has gone on to get us to this place. The other iconic part of the telescope and the biggest structure on the telescope is the giant sun shield. So this is a five-layer sun shield that protects the mirrors and the instruments from the light and the heat of the sun. Of course, all of these elements require extensive testing, and testing has been going on for pretty much since the start of the, the whole program. All the elements are tested uh, at their individual levels and then as bigger systems. In fact, if you go to our website on our homepage, you can watch a live webcam of some of this testing going on right now at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. In just a couple of months, we'll ship the mirrors and the instruments down to Johnson Space Center in Houston, where it will undergo extreme cryogenic testing in the giant Chamber A, which is the chamber that was used to test the Apollo era spacecraft. Old meets new, history meets the future. And oh, by the way, we have a really intricate deployment sequence that we have to do with this telescope. So launch is only the beginning. Once it gets into space, it has to unfold, and this whole process takes about two weeks. Now, today, we can take Plato's words more literally. Today, right now, NASA is building the rockets and the capsules that will take human beings to Mars. Today, we're dreaming and building the telescopes, Webb and its successors, that will ultimately find life elsewhere than our pale blue dot. Astronomy and this deep drive to explore is what drives us towards these missions. The reason we build these missions is because of the promise of discovery. It's the promise of hundreds of billions of planets and hundreds of billions of galaxies and countless untold surprises waiting to be discovered. Thank you. Thank you.